My name is Nikolai Wolf, and uh, as a trustee of this great university, and I think more importantly as president of the NYU Alumni Association, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to our NYU Be Together Alumni Conference. Round of applause, please. Now, whether you're joining us here live from Washington Square or tuning in from elsewhere around the globe, we appreciate you investing your time to participate and know that you'll leave this conference with some pretty powerful takeaways. Uh, as you know, the NYU Alumni Association represents a network of over 600,000 alumni. And while effectively engaging uh, that many people does present a big challenge, I think it also presents an even bigger opportunity uh, to promote a culture that welcomes you, encourages you, to be yourself and your authentic self, and maybe even more importantly, inspires you to give back to the university in ways that are meaningful to you. Uh, as I shared with the Alumni Association Board in the fall, our work is absolutely meaningless unless we first consider the people we serve and do so in a way that recognizes, acknowledges, and respects your individuality and the personal dimensions that make you, you. Uh, so we are committed to supporting the unique journeys of each and every one of you, committed to expanding our capacity in the areas of diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity, and access, and committed to building platforms that help bring that to life. I think special alumni events like this Be Together Conference demonstrate that in a real way. Uh, so that said, we have a great night ahead. Looking forward to our tremendous speakers who are here at this table and who will be joining us in the chair shortly. And I also look forward to us talking afterwards, hearing some ideas about how we can engage you even better and more effectively as an alumni association. Uh, but before we do that, I'll pass the mic to someone who is an exceptional leader in our alumni community and someone who I'm privileged to share uh, the stage with tonight. So Gabby Royal, please. All right. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabby Royal. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a proud member of the NYUAA Board of Directors and the Be Together Alumni Conference Planning Committee. Um, on behalf of this committee, uh, we're so excited and we thank you all so, so much for joining today, this evening. Um, this is a really special conference. We're looking forward to a really, really engaging conversation this evening. And this conference is, is really designed to center the vitality of the the diverse alumni communities at NYU, and to really work to highlight the efforts of individuals building a pipeline of diver diverse alumni, and to continue to champion the work that we're all doing um, for our flagship alumni identity networks at NYU. A few of those we'd like to recognize tonight are NYU Asian Pacific Islander and Daisy Alumni Network, our NYU Black Alumni Network, our NYU Latinx Alumni Network, our NYU LGBTQ plus alumni network, and our NYU Native and Indigenous Alumni Network. Um, today, we'd also just like to recognize and to show our appreciation and gratitude for the volunteerism efforts for making tonight possible, inclusive of our NYU um, flagship identity networks and our group of volunteers. So thank you so much. Yes, please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. And as we know, critical to the future of these groups at NYU and our commitment is really to provide a comprehensive and enriching education uh, program for diverse students. And so in that, with this in mind, we'd like to really turn our attention tonight and this evening to discuss some of the many, many challenges faced by higher education right now. We're gonna turn our attention to discuss some of the topics and some of the challenges that we're faced as a country right now and how we can continue to engage on this meaningful, meaningful dialogue around affirmative action, around critical race theory, as well as LGBTQ plus inclusion and other topics within education. So with that, Nick, I'll turn it back over to you, my friend. Well, Gabby, whet your appetite, and so we'll just jump right in with introductions. And I'll start with Dr. Lisa Coleman. Uh, Dr. Coleman is New York University's inaugural Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation. Among the many teams that Dr. Coleman works with here at NYU, she collaborates closely with the Office of the Provost, School Deans, and your Alumni Relations Office to, as I noted earlier, 
advance, promote, and build capacity uh, for strategic global inclusion, diversity, belonging, equity, access, and innovation initiatives across NYU's global network. Dr. Coleman has been a great resource to our board and has helped accelerate our progress towards a more inclusive future. I'm happy to say that Dr. Coleman is also a proud Violet uh, who earned her doctorate in social and cultural analysis. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, we're all Violets here. Uh, who, who earned her doctorate in social and cultural analysis in American studies, as I said, from NYU. So she really does understand and speak from the NYU alumni perspective. Thank you so much. And our second speaker, Kenji Yoshino. Kenji. Kenji is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professor of Constitutional Law and the director of the Center, the Meltzer Center for Diversity, Inclusion, Belonging at NYU School of Law. Yoshino specializes in constitutional law, anti-discrimination law, and law and literature. Um, he's an author who tonight we will be discussing his book entitled Say the Right Thing, How to Talk About Identity, Diversity, and Justice. Um, and this is really the stepping off point for today's conference. Um, Yoshino is published in major academic journals, including the Harvard Law Review, the Stanford Law Review, and the Yale Journal. All right, he has also written more popular forums, and that's including the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post. He makes regular appearances on radio, television programs such as NPR, CNN, PBS, MSNBC, and we are so, so thrilled to have him tonight in conversation with Dr. Coleman. So please also be aware that for tonight's uh, program, this will be recorded and available for a rewatch um, following the conference. And lastly, thank you so much for those that took time to submit questions and also to post in the discussion board. Um, and so we look forward to answering those questions and having those addressed. Without further ado, we're excited to welcome Lisa and Kenji. Please join us on the stage. Hello, hello. Well, hello everyone. So pleased to be here with you this evening. I'm a very proud Violet. I know I don't have on any um, Violet right now um, because I'm a true New Yorker wearing all black, but um, I, uh, I am a very proud Violet. So I'm really happy to be here with you all this evening and I'm even just thrilled to be here with you, Kenji. You know, you know how I feel about you and I'm so excited about your new book. If you haven't gotten it, get the new book. It's fantastic. So we're going to jump in. Before I do that, I just want to give a couple thank yous. Thank you, of course, to Nick. Where'd you go? I can't see you. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your great leadership. Thank you, Gabby, for all of your great leadership and, of course, partnership and work you are, are doing with our boards, our alumni boards. Uh, thank you to everyone who organized these sessions, right? Uh, and that includes uh, Amanda and Jenny and the entire conference planning committee, of course, and, of course, Chris from OGI. Thank you, and Autumn. And let me say, and everyone who's worked behind the scenes, right? Those people who keep the lights on, who will clean up behind us after we're gone, who are serving us the drinks, who are doing all that. Can we give them a round of applause? And thank you, Amanda. Okay, so um, without further ado, I'm just gonna jump in and we're gonna talk. And so um, I've already told Kenji, I love this book, okay? What, did I hold it up already? Okay. Um, and I also want to also say, and we're gonna give Kenji a round of applause because he has uh, been uh, selected as the Ascend 2023 A-list honoree and he will be receiving his award later, later this year. But thank you to Ascend and congratulations to you, Kenji. Thank you so much. I know you had, a, I saw your hand in that nomination. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well. Um, it's always important to recognize good work. Okay. So, um, and I also want to say, um, I just want to thank you and all of the people who have been doing such incredible work to really think about global diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, access, identity. And um, we're going to talk about some of the other terms, et cetera. Um, but I really think that, you know, this work, it's hard. It's hard work. And 
your book is incredibly thoughtful. You engaged with your co-author and at your students, and you can see the passages and the residue of that. And so just amazing work. And so also, uh, congratulations to your center. You heard uh, from everyone. The Metzler Center has been just doing some terrific work as well. So congratulations to you on that as well. Thank you so much. Yes. OK, so let's start, uh, let's start with this question. So how did Say the Right Thing come about? Yes, yeah, so it came about because we saw the same problem over and over again at my Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, which uh, was recently endowed by NYU alum uh, Roger Meltzer, so now bears his name. And that issue was we want to be allies, uh, but we're terrified of saying the wrong thing. So we actually didn't find there was a lot of resistance to the idea that people should stand up for each other and be allies. And what we found was kind of freezing people into place was that they worried in one of two directions. They either worried that they would say the wrong thing and hurt someone they cared about and get canceled themselves, or alternatively, they worried that they would be galvanized into action by the notion that silence was not neutrality but complicity, but then go like bulls in china shops and wreak havoc because they didn't know enough to act. And so what we tried to do in a very, very practical, shame-free way is to put together some principles that would allow people to chart a middle path through those two extremes so that people would have the proper tools to act with confidence and therefore be able to close the gap between that almost universal desire to be an ally to at least some people and effective allyship. Excuse me, absolutely. And so as you, um, you, know, you know, many of us are familiar with your earlier work on covering, right? And sort of thinking about that in relation to this book. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that informed this book? Absolutely. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this work, uh, I sort of cut my teeth as a, a young professor on the idea of covering. Uh, and the idea of covering is that even after you are formally included within an organization, uh, the organization may place various kinds of pressure on you to downplay or mute your outsider identities so that people in the organization can be more comfortable around you. So for me, this was autobiographical in that you know, I got hired at my prior institution as an openly gay man. And so I thought I can finally stop managing my sexual orientation because this is the first job I've ever had where everyone who raised their hand to hire me knew that I was gay. But no sooner did I arrive there as a tenure track professor than a very well-meaning, very friendly colleague put his arm around me and said, Kenji, you'll do a lot better here if you are a homosexual professional than if you are a professional homosexual. And I knew exactly what he meant. He meant, you'll do a lot better if you're like the mainstream constitutional law professor who teaches federalism and separation of powers and just happens to be gay kind of on the side than if you are the gay rights professor who teaches gay rights classes, writes on gay rights subjects, and works on gay rights cases. Fortunately, of course, it was the latter that I wanted to do. So I worked my way through it. You know, I acceded to this covering demand, such as the terror of the tenure track for a couple of years. And then I realized I would much rather not get tenure as somebody who I was than get tenure as somebody who I wasn't. And so I flipped back over to writing about what I was passionate about and then ultimately did get tenure unanimously. But I still didn't have a word for that demand that was being made on me because it wasn't the demand to pass. You know, this is a very pro-gay institution. I was like formally there within the ranks of the faculty. But I was being asked to mute, to edit, my identity in ways that would make other individuals in the predominantly straight institution more comfortable around me. And what made me so hopeful about this idea, Lisa, as you know, was that when you're talking about passing, that only pertains to certain individuals, right? Only certain cohorts like sexual minorities, religious minorities, some individuals with disabilities can sort of pass as somebody in the dominant group. But when we get to covering, which is not about sort of who you are, but rather how you self-present, that directs itself at the behavioral aspects of your identity, and so therefore everyone can be asked to cover. So I'm talking about you know, the black woman who's told to straighten her hair to look more professional. You know, I'm talking about the person with a disability who's told to use a cane rather than a wheelchair, whether implicitly or explicitly, because people are uncomfortable when they wheel into a room. You know, I'm talking about you know, the Asian indiv individual who's told to not act so fresh off the boat. 
um, talking about the woman who's told to act as tearless or aggressive or as analytic or as, you know, emotionless as the stereotypical man is in order to be respected as a colleague in the workplace, right? So that was uh, work on covering, and, you know, it's been thrilling to sort of watch it sort of um, make, have some traction in the world. But in terms of how it ties to this book, you know, when we were tasked with solutions about how we would create the environment in which people would feel more comfortable and have the psychological safety to uncover, I mean, just think about it. All of us in this room have covered, right, at some point in our lives. What would the predicates be so that we could bring more of ourselves at work and stop sort of working our identities alongside our jobs, right? And there, that's where allyship comes in, because this is not work that any of us can do ourselves. As uh, Heckman and Johnson research, among many other studies, suggests, people are much more effective speaking on behalf of somebody else than they are speaking up on their own behalf. So if I want to interrupt a covering demand on behalf of one of my colleagues, I am the cheapest cost avoider. I am the person who can speak up and not take the hit for doing that. Whereas if I speak up on my own behalf, I'm a snowflake, I'm a whiner, I'm a complainer, and I'm just not going to be heard in the same way. And so that's what led me to allyship. And this, and so as we talk more about this concept of allyship, and you write this book and you say that no one can afford to sit outside of these conversations. And in fact, then you go on to talk about the democratiz uh, uh, is it the democratization of discomfort. And so talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I actually, you know, despite the many, many things that make me want to sort of tear my hair out, right, about, I mean, I'm a constitutional lawyer, okay, so this is not a fun time to be doing constitutional <laughs> law, right, so despite all the things that make me want to tear my hair out about uh, the current state of our democracy and our polity, there is actually one aspect uh, that I'm very hopeful about, which is that we are seeing a real uptick, right, in allyship, right, so that we are seeing a lot of white individuals or non-black individuals at Black Lives Matter protests, right? We're seeing like a lot of non-Asian individuals at Stop Asian Hate protests, right? We're seeing a lot of men in the Women's March on Washington. We're seeing a lot of cisgender and heterosexual allies, right, for the LGBT community. And I think what that suggests is that this is a nation that's much more diverse and much more aware of its own diversity than it has ever been before. And that actually also leads to the backlash effects that make me want to tear my hair out, right? So both sides are getting louder and stronger. But you know, on my side of the equation as a progressive, what I'm seeing is what Jennifer Richardson, the psychologist at Yale, calls the democratization of discomfort. So, so often in these conversations, right, what we hear is the dominant group person, right, saying, why am I so uncomfortable in this conversation? And what I always say to that individual, so this is the white person talking about race or, you know, the straight person talking about sexual orientation or me as a man talking about feminism, right? Why am I so uncomfortable? I want us to reframe that question to ask, why have I been so comfortable until now? Because if we frame the question in that way, we realize that the reason that the conversation has been comfortable for us until this point is that the other side of the conversation as the less empowered party has carried all of the agony of that conversation for us until this moment. So the democratization of discomfort, the rise of allyship, the greater awareness of our own nation's diversity is democratizing that discomfort so that as an ally, I'm actually being asked to pick up just a tiny piece of that Right, and to use my power and privilege in order to advance the cause of justice for the disempowered individual. So instead of thinking about, you know, why is it you know, that I'm so uncomfortable in this conversation, I think the question is, why have I been so comfortable until this point? And when we ask the question that way, I think we begin to realize that these conversations, if we truly believe in justice and inclusion and equity, are inevitable. Like, it's not just that we're going to run across somebody who's diverse, right, in our life, and we're going to have to have these conversations. So even if you don't want to have them, you're going to have them. But it's also that if you have an ethical consciousness about these issues, you have to want to be able to sit in that discomfort and lean into it. And what this book is trying to do is to say, here are some strategies to not, you know, alleviate discomfort, but to make sure that discomfort is not turning into distress, like such acute distress that you can no longer sit in the conversation. And this leads right into... <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Royal <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful to hear that. 
And in this text, you also, um, you talk about navigating these difficult conversations as an ally. And you also talk about mistakes, right? And then you have this concept, the magical yet. Could you talk to us about that? Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to rely heavily here uh, for, on another colleague of mine here at NYU, the wonderful kind of inim inimitable uh, Dolly Chug. We love Dolly. At the Stern School. Yeah. yeah, I love Dolly too. She's just extraordinary. So uh, let me actually back up before we get to Dolly and say that one of the things that we talk about in this book is the four kind of conversational traps that all of us can fall into as allies. And these four conversational traps are when someone confronts you with non-inclusive behavior, we have a tendency when we're challenged to do what we call ADDA. So avoid, deflect, deny, attack. Right? So let's say someone comes to me and says, you know, Professor Yoshino, I think that what you said was sexist in that class. Right? How am I going to react? Right? Well, a past experience, you know, both in my own life and in the world, uh, is any guide, I'm going to be so flooded with self-threat at that accusation that I'm likely not to be able to respond in a productive way unless I can recognize the pitfalls that we tend to fall into when we're flooded with that self-threat. So that avoid is, oh, look at the time. I have another meeting to go to. I can't have this conversation with you. Right? <laughs> Deflect is, oh, like you may have a point there, but you know, I'm going to deflect to something else. And so I can deflect to many other things. I could deflect to tone. I could say, I don't appreciate the way you frame that. So you may have a point, but like you were really aggressive and hurtful in the way you framed it. And so suddenly we're talking about how the information was couched rather than the original complaint itself. I could deflect to my own credentials saying, I'm a civil rights lawyer. Like I spent my entire life working on these issues. How dare you uh, call me a sexist, right? Or I could deflect to my intentions. I may have done that, but my intentions were totally good. All unhelpful, right? Responses that sort of detract from honoring a complaint that's actually been uh, raised with me. Uh, deny is even more aggressive. These get progressively more and more aggressive as uh, we go down uh, the list. Deny would be either I deny that that happened, right? So I'm going to challenge you on the factual predicates, or I deny the legitimacy of the complaint, right? That you know other women have made it, you just haven't made it because you know you're just not as meritorious as the other woman. I know I did hire as my research assistants or what have you. And then finally, attack is the most kind of vicious of all in that it carries the war into the enemy's camp, right? And it says, you know, well, you're no prize yourself. You know, you know, how about your behavior? I think that you were in my class. You know, you demonstrated kind of microaggressions on the basis of race or sexual orientation. So, you know, you're no better than you claim uh, that I am, right? And so if we just identify those, I saw some nods. I hope that was generalized. I think that if we look into our souls, we can see that we've at least been tempted Right, to end the conversation, to shut it down, right, because we're so threatened by the conversation. And that's where Dolly comes in. So Dolly has taught me so much, but the two things that I want to uh, land on are, first of all, uh, this notion that when she opens her classes, she flashes up a slide and she says, look at this terrible professor, right? Uh, this professor has misgendered trans colleagues. This professor has laughed at inappropriate jokes. This person has confused people of the same race or ethnicity with each other and called them by each other's names, right? And you see where this is going, right? The next slide is, and that professor was me. Think of how inclusive and courageous that move is, right? I mean, I've adopted this in my own teaching because I think it is such a powerful message to send to our students to say, I'm not above this. I make mistakes too. I'm learning and growing, right? And if you're able to have the kind of intestinal fortitude, what we call resilience, right, in uh, these conversations, then that's going to go a long way towards getting past ADDA behaviors, right? Because you're not presenting yourself to the world as perfect, right? You're going to the classroom saying, I'm a deeply imperfect person. I'm still learning and growing. I'm a person who will make mistakes in this area. So the next time someone comes to me and says, Professor Yoshino, I think you did something sexist, I'm able to tolerate that discomfort because I've never even set myself up right, for the fall by saying, I'm perfect, I have it all sewn up, I have authority, I have power right, in this conversation, and therefore, uh, you're not allowed to challenge me. And then the other solution that uh, is specific to Dolly's wonderful book, and we draw on her work uh, very heavily in our book, uh, which is uh, the magical yet that you talk about. So she says, isn't it so funny that all of us believe in the growth mindset in the educational domain. The growth mindset is this notion that our capabilities are susceptible to expansion. And the psychologist Carol Dweck has shown that the growth mindset always beats out 
the fixed mindset, which is the mindset that believes that your capabilities are set, immutable, right? They're not capable of being uh, expanded. So whether it's athletics or business or academia, the growth mindset will always beat out the fixed mindset. So we all kind of know this at some level. Even my 10-year-old son is not allowed to say at his school, I'm not good at math. He's corrected and told to think about it as, I'm not good at math, comma, yet. But what Dolly points out, Professor Chug, I should say, is that you know, when we get to diversity and inclusion, all that goes out the window. So even like ardent acolytes of the growth mindset fall back into the fixed mindset because they're so flooded with self-threat in these conversations that they have to fight their corner. Right? And it's very hard to sort of sustain a growth mindset when you feel like a mistake that you've made is so catastrophic that it's not going to be just about what you did, but about who you are. Right? It's not just like, I made a mistake in constitutional law, big deal, go read another case. You'll learn more from it than from one of your successes, right? if you make that kind of mistake. But if I make a mistake and a student calls me sexist, then suddenly I'm a certain kind of person. I'm a sexist, I'm a racist, I'm a homophobe, I'm a transphobe, I'm some kind of bigot. Right? And that's going to push me back into the fixed mindset. So what Choke says is, you know, both simple and revolutionary, right? and saying, Let's just take the strategies we use for growth mindset and make sure that we consistently apply them even in the realm of diversity and inclusion. So when I misgender a colleague or when I make a sexist comment, you know, I shouldn't berate myself and say, you know, I'm not good at pronouns or I'm not good at being a mentor to women. Right? I should instead have the self-talk that says, I'm not good at pronouns, comma, yet. I'm not yet a good mentor to women. Right? I have room to grow. And what I love about this is that you know, she distinguishes between good and bad people. And she says, let's let go of this good-bad dichotomy, and let's all try to be good-ish people, right? Because that suggests that we're all on the journey together. And that's very much the ethos of resilience that we adopt in the book. Terrific. Yeah, go right ahead. Which leads me to my next question. So you talk quite a bit about curiosity, right? And um, obviously building on the growth mindset. And you also talk about learning, you know, what it ta how to learn, right? Especially if you've made a mistake. So could you talk to us a little bit about some of the suggestions you make about research and expertise and what, why you're using those suggestions in terms of then how you grow as an individual and, 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 and use that curiosity for the yet? Yeah, I, I love that. Thank you. So, you know, we think of resilience as like table stakes, right? Because if you don't have resilience, you can't have curiosity. But right after, because if you feel fear, like fear and curiosity have an inverse relationship to each other. Last time you were fearful, right? Think about how curious you were. You were actually so focused on yourself and self-preservation that you couldn't be curious about another human being, right? So resilience is table stakes, but once you have resilience, the next thing we want you to grow uh, is your curiosity. And we essentially have three tips here, right? The first one is you know, dealing with kind of known unknowns, like just sort of highlighting to yourself what you don't know, right? So if I'm talking to a person with a disability, as someone who is able-bodied, you know, I know, or is currently doesn't have a motor function disability, I should be more precise about that, uh, I am not gonna know in the same way that someone with a motor disability will know where the curb cuts are, right, in my building, which classrooms are accessible, right? What kinds of everyday kind of bias that person might have to struggle with. So I know I don't know that, right? And it's really incumbent on me to be open and curious about learning about that experience and not assuming that I know. When Sherilyn Eiffel, the president of the LDF, came to our center, what she said was, you know, I don't think the Supreme Court justices are arrogant people, right? Uh, because if there's something that, you know, they um, don't know about, like social media, they'll, you know, appoint a special master or they'll read the amicus briefs really carefully. But what troubles me about them is that they think that they get information about race osmotically, that just because they've lived in a multiracial society, they're suddenly experts on race and that they don't need to go out and look and learn about that expertise, right? So the first thing is you don't know as much as you think you know, right? And so just learn it, right? And so that's a really easy one, right? We're academics, we all know how to do this, right? We're in a university community. The second one is harder, right? So here I'm going to use Donald Rumsfeld's distinction between the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, right? Uh, so sometimes you don't even know that you don't know, and you're ignorant of your own ignorance. And that can be much trickier, right? Because, again, I hope I'm not alone and having been in a conversation. And then I realize that, like, I'm just kind of 
totally out of the blue. It's like a bolt from the blue. It's like, I just did not know this. Like, I did not know that masking was exactly, and someone said, like, what is, how does your notion of covering relate to masking in the neurodiverse context? It's like, I have no idea, right? You know, I didn't even know that that was a thing, and, like, I've probably used masking in different contexts without realizing that it had this particular salience in the neurodiverse community. So I just didn't know that I didn't know, right? So how do we avoid this? It's much harder, right? Because there's no, by definition, determinate body of knowledge that's out there that we can sort of you know, work on, right? We just don't know that we don't know. And here, I find the social scientists less helpful than the humanists. So there's a wonderful epistemologist, a philosopher named Christy Dotson, who says, whenever you're in a diversity and inclusion conversation, pretend that you're in a nuclear physics seminar. So such is the caliber of this group that with my luck, some of you are like nuclear physicists. If that's true, like just imagine some other kind of intimidating and arcane body of knowledge that scares you, right? But for me, like I think of myself as a decently smart person, but if I think of myself in that nuclear physics seminar, I'm terrified about what I know. And I adopt a posture of radical humility. Even if I think I understood something, even if I've done all the reading, I will kick the tires multiple times to make sure that I know something. Right. So I will listen very, very attentively, and I will share very, very tentatively right, after I've listened. Right. And so that posture of radical humility is what you know, I think is, is warranted. And the third piece of curiosity is just being aware of what Darrell Wing Sui, the uh, education professor, calls the running internal commentary of skepticism. So in the book, what we say is one of the things that interrupts our own kind of openness and curiosity about another human being's experience is all the unconscious bias and counter-programming, right, that we experience in society, right? So, you know, we sort of articulate it as someone is telling you something, and it's like they're on TV, and they're telling you a story, but there's like a chiron, a running crawl underneath them that like rebuts everything that they say, right? So I could say, you know, and this is his example, like, oh, I went to a restaurant the other day and I was there first, but I wasn't seated. And I think that it was because I was Asian, right? And then I could be saying that, but because of unconscious biases that people have, the running internal commentary skepticism that's crawling underneath me is, well, maybe the other family that was seated before you had reservations and you didn't, right? Or maybe the maitre d' just saw them and didn't see you, or just multiple explanations. So given that people very rarely come out and say, like, I discriminate against you because you're Asian, right? That alternative explanation is always going to be possible. And so therefore, that internal running commentary is going to be there. And what we need to do is to spot it and stop it so that we can actually, with open ears and open hearts, hear what the other person is trying to say to us. Controversy scale. Talk to us about the controversy scale because yes. let's let's face it, we've got a lot of disagreement out there. We've got lots of controversy. I'd like to suggest that you're in the thick of some of these things. So talk to us about controversy scale. Yeah. So I have to give uh, huge props to my co-author David Glasgow on this. He's the executive director of my center, and he came up with the controversy scale because we were trying to puzzle through why some disagreements felt so inflammatory, which is, I think, just obvious looking in the public sphere, but also like why people had such differing views about whether a disagreement was allowed or not allowed, or whether it was even inflammatory or not. And what we realize is that there are different kinds of controversies that array themselves along a scale. So think about a scale that runs from kind of cold to hot, right? So on the cool side of the scale, there is, you know, tastes, facts, then policies, than values. And at the furthest extreme, the hottest of the hot, are equal humanity. Right? So if you and I are having a disagreement about which Netflix show is the best show, or about which flavor of ice cream is the best ice cream, or which kind of music is the best, we can razz each other about that. And that's actually going to like enhance intimacy between us, more likely than not. It's not likely to be like a deal breaker. right? But as we scud over to the right-hand side of the spectrum, the controversy can get hotter and hotter. So facts, probably OK, so long as we're talking about real journalistic facts of who, what, when, where, and why, as opposed to like values by proxy kinds of facts, like alternative facts or those kinds of debates. Once we get to policies, a little hotter. Values, even hotter. But the hottest is the equal humanity, right? So this is a quote that's often misattributed to James Baldwin, right? Of we can disagree, but when your disagreement calls into question my equal humanity, we no longer have a disagreement. You're no longer allowed to say those things, right? 
So one of the things that David pointed out is that the reason that we miss each other often in diversity and inclusion disagreements is that we're just at different points on the controversy scale. And the example I always give here is that, you know, prior to 2015 when same-sex marriage became the law of the land, you know, I toured the country sort of debating people about whether or not same-sex marriage should be legalized under uh, our constitutional guarantees of privacy and, and equal protection. And oftentimes in the green room before these public debates, my party opposite would say to me, I know you're gay, I know you have a partner, I know you have kids, so I know this is really personal to you. Could you not talk about that when we go out on stage? Because this is supposed to be a constitutional law debate, right? And I feel like it would be too much of a case of special pleading if you made these emotional appeals to your personal life, right? And you know, this may actually surprise some of you, but like I would be like, Absolutely, like I have no desire to win on any other grounds than the Constitution of the United States because I know I can win that argument, right? Uh, so let's go, right? But you know, every time someone would make that kind of comment to me, I would think like, goodness, like you could have done yourself so much good and no harm at all if you had just approached me a little bit differently, which is to say, if you had approached me and said, I think we're at different points on the controversy scale, for me, I'm just arguing this as a matter of policy and values, but I realize that this lands on you as an issue of your equal humanity, that what's on the table is whether or not you are equal to the rest of society, right? And whether or not you can give your kids the same kind of protection that I can give my kids. So I, want to I disagree with you on these issues, but I hope that we can have this debate in a way where I can honor the fact that we're at different points in the controversy scale. So the point about this is not that you have to go to where the other person is. In some ways, you really can't do that, right? You can't sort of say, I can fully inhabit your experience. But that you acknowledge where the other person is and that the disagreement might land differently on them than it is for you. And then you can make your arguments as you will uh, with hopefully continuing across the conversation sensitivity for why that other individual may feel differently about the controversy than you do. Thank you. And so let's talk now a little bit about red, yellow, and green, all right? And yeah. talk a little bit about how you talk about, right, actually apologizing and thinking about accountability. And one of the things I'll say about this text is part of the loveliness of it is that it gives you very practical um, sort of advice and things to do. So just a plug for that. And also uh, it's written, and I'll say this, um, there, it, there's a lot of um, references to pop culture and things in sort of the references and, and some of the students provided that. I just asked Kenji about that. So it also resonates as current and relevant for those of you who haven't read the text. So I, I just wanted to offer that as well. So tell us a little bit about Red, Yellow, and Green. Yeah, I have to give a shout out to my, our incredible students. So we had like over 20 students helping us doing the research on this book. They were so passionate, they were so engaged. They're like a credit to this institution and to this community and, and, and to all of us. So I really wanna uh, thank them as being like incredible resources, even though they did make me feel like even older than my kids make <laughs> me feel. Like in some ways, like the kids are easy because they say like, oh, you're so cringe that you don't know who Olivia Rodrigo is, and it's like, yeah, I don't, right? <laughs> uh, but when the students actually put it in this very gentle way of like, you may or may not know who Sia is, it's more painful, right? Because it's like, it's so polite and it's, it's kind of more proximate so in true. your peripheral vision. Yeah, but uh, anyway, um, so they helped with the contemporary uh, examples. But going back to the uh, red, yellow, and green disagreements, you know, uh, so this is just traffic light coding, right? So lest you know, I may have seemed sort of too um, uh, mealy mouthed, right, in saying like, oh, we should we should always be able to disagree. Uh, we actually say we believe that there are things where the debate has just closed, right? So there are red disagreements where. You can adopt the controversy scale, but you shouldn't expect to get very far, right? So if I say, you know, racial minorities, you know, should not be included in institutions of higher learning, like, goodbye, right? We're not having that conversation, right? And, you know, this can change over time, right? Because some, you know, debates that were, you know, read today were at some point in history green disagreements, which was there a matter of public debate and uh, public interest, right? 
So today, you know, I would characterize a green disagreement as, as something along the lines of let's look at the frontiers of diversity and inclusion. So debates that we're having about, say, I talked about same-sex marriage, which I think it's kind of more in the yellow zone now. But a green disagreement would be like, you know, should marriage, plural marriage be recognized? Should polyamory be recognized? And I think that that's a debate that we can have, right, and that people of good faith can disagree on. Uh, but we have to understand that, again, not all disagreements are created equal, but this time not along the controversy scale that sort of types out the kind of disagreement that you're having, but now in terms of just the arc of history and moral consensus, right, such that we're no longer going to waste our time and our energy debating things that are now just settled, right, because we've already had those debates and all the arguments that we can think of, right, have already been put on the table and history has made that judgment. So this traffic light coding is to add a little bit of kind of moral certainty here, where I sometimes think it's lacking, of like, I'm not saying, and I want to really emphasize this, that if someone says, you know, oh, okay, so we're going to debate, you know, whether or not, like, you know, Asian people and white people, like, are equal, should be equal under the law. I'm not going to have that debate with you. And it's no amount of, oh, well, I understand that this implicates your equal humanity. It's going to cut it, right, because it's in that red category. So there are two kinds of taxonomies that are operational here. One is about the kind of argument, and one is about the historical context. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, and the residue of that, for sure. So let's, um, let's talk about this. Uh, we're, we have about 10 more minutes of conversation, and then we're going to open it up to uh, questions so that you all are ready. We have a mic in the back. So I'm probably going to ask Kenji maybe a couple more questions, and then we'll open it up. So um, let's talk about this platinum rule, all right, and treatment. So, um, so tell, tell our audience about the platinum rule and how you are operationalizing that in the text. Yeah, so this is about, you know, the nuts and bolts of allyship towards the end of the book. Uh, and what we say is, first of all, like, think about uh, allyship as a triangle, right? Because every allyship situation involves at least three parties. Uh, there's the ally, there's the affected person, and there's the source. So think about it as I saw it, it happened to me, the affected person, or I did it. You know, I was a source of trouble or non-inclusive behavior in this instance. And even though we all want to sit in the allied chair, let's understand that this is a game of musical chairs, right? And that over the course of a single month, you might be the ally in some situations, the affected person in others, and the source of non-inclusive behavior and yet other situations. And in fact, you know, it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when. You yourself will be the source of non-inclusive behavior, much as all of us want to avoid that seat. So we create this thing called the empathy triangle, which you know, we can send out the graphic afterwards if it's helpful. But the empathy triangle really gives prompts for how to talk to yourself before you enter into an ally situation, and that includes things like resilience and curiosity. But it also includes how to address uh, the affected person, and then finally how to address the source of non-inclusive behavior. So the platinum rule has to do with how you address the affected person. And the platinum rule says, you know, in contrast to the golden rule that says treat the other person as you would wish to be treated, please treat the other person as they would wish to be treated. Because the whole point of allyship is that you're an ally because you have some form of advantage that the affected person lacks. Right? And so that means your capacity to imagine your way into their experience is going to be radically incomplete. And therefore, you need to sort of ask what they want from the interaction, rather than imaginatively putting yourself in the situation, saying, what would I want in this situation? Because you're not always going to know that, right, just on your store of experience. So have the conversation. So the platinum rule sort of cashes out into various kind of lower level prescriptions. So one is uh, to ask yourself, does a person even want help? So oftentimes this puzzles people because they say, oh, I see a colleague of mine, they seem to be in trouble. Of course, I'm not going to force them to ask me. I'm going to jump in and help them. But one of the things that we know increasingly is that that can blow up in our faces uh, because it can be viewed to be a kind of saviorism. So the psychologist who we found most helpful on this is Monica Schneider, who did some studies beginning in the 1990s that said, what happens when white teaching assistants give unsolicited help on a word test to black students? And what happens is that those black students emerge with lower self-esteem and greater resentment towards the ally than either the black students who didn't receive the help or the white students who did receive the unsolicited help. So there's some toxic mashup of the unsolicited nature of the help and the stereotypes surrounding the group that lead this to be seen as a message of, you can't hack it on your own unless I ride in as a savior. 
or global network universities, so let me pluralize my examples for a global audience. This study was replicated in Israel with Israeli teaching assist ass assistants giving unsolicited help to Arab students and exactly the same result obtained. The Arab students emerged from that interaction with lower self-esteem and greater resentment than either the Arab students who did not receive the help or the Israeli students who did receive the unsolicited help. So what we say is ask. You know, it's not possible in every circumstance to ask, but where you can, ask. Go to the person and say, I noticed and cared right, about this situation. May I be your ally in this situation? If they say yes, then you can strategize together about what form of allyship might be most helpful to them. If they say no, that may sting a little bit because it's rejection of your allyship, but you've still done incredibly important work, which is to reveal yourself to the other party as a real ally. Right? One of the things we hear over and over again from affected people is that they don't know who their real allies are in a room, in a workplace, in any situation. Right? There's a lot of performative and optical allyship going on, and then when push comes to shove, the people aren't really there. But if you say to somebody, I noticed and cared about this thing that other people may not have noticed and cared about, and I want to step up to be your ally, they've banked you. So even though they don't need you today, a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now, they can come back and say, I didn't need you then, but goodness, do I need you now? And can you actually apply the platinum rule and help me? All right, we're rounding into this last question. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> And uh, your uh, last section is be, be generous to the source. Talk to us about being generous to the source. Yeah, I'm so glad we get to talk about this because frankly, this is like the most controversial part of the book uh, because people say like, why on earth should I be an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior? That's a bad actor. So maybe I shouldn't cancel them, but I shouldn't be spending any of my energy on them uh, because they're the people who are the perpetrators of uh, the situation. And our response to that is you should be an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior, we hope, because someday that source is going to be you. This is a game of musical chairs. As I mentioned, you know, I've done all the things that Dolly Chug said, right? So I've misgendered students. I've confused students of the same ethnic group with each other and called them by each other's names. I've laughed at inappropriate jokes. I have been the source of non-inclusive behavior. If I had a time machine, I would correct every single one of those things. I deeply regret them. But I know that I'm going to be in that place again someday. So knowing that that's true of all of us, I think it really behooves us to try to put the pause on cancel culture and be an ally even to the source of non-inclusive behavior. So does this mean anything goes? Again, no. There are two circumstances in which we actually don't want you to feel like you need to be an ally to the source. If the behavior is truly egregious, like rank bigotry or illegal harassment or discrimination, you don't need to be an ally to the source. If the source has no interest in getting better, you don't need to be an ally to the source. Right? But in circumstances, which we think is the vast majority of situations that you're going to encounter in your day-to-day -day lives, where the person hasn't done something truly egregious and has some interest in getting better, we think that it really helps the entire ecosystem for you to be a, an ally to the source of non-inclusive behavior. So imagine the situation where I have misgendered a colleague and I'm stewing in my office. Is it better Right, for the law school to just cancel me and the students to shun me in the hallways because I've done what I admit is bad, a bad thing. Right? Or is it better for Lisa to come knock on my door and to say, Kenji, that wasn't great. She doesn't need to sugarcoat. She can call out the behavior. But say, like, you know, that surprised me because I experienced you as a really inclusive person and that behavior fell short of that. Or alternatively, you know, that wasn't great. But listen, I did something very similar in the past and I've survived to tell the tale. Tomorrow I'll probably you know, mess up again, and then I hope you're knocking on my door uh, trying to help me be an ally. So more broadly, this is kind of a, a critique or a challenge to cancel culture, uh, because the notion is cancel culture can sometimes, in the egregious cases, be extremely helpful, and then it's just consequence culture, right? Uh, so, you know, if you've done something truly egregious, I'm not shedding any tears if the world sort of says, you know, you need to sort of sit out for a while, right? But falling short of that, what we want to do is to say cancel culture can be indiscriminately punitive right, and can lead to the fear that either leads to villain origin stories or people who might otherwise have been very sympathetic to uh, diversity inclusion suddenly turn on it. Or alternatively, it can just lead to a sense of like fear uh, that you'll be indiscriminately punished such that people don't even step in to these conversations in the first place. Right? So what we want to do is to say let's try to move from cancel culture to a coaching culture. 
right? Because a coaching culture has neither of those two features that I criticize. It's neither indiscriminately punitive, nor does it like abruptly cancel somebody. Instead, it sort of puts an arm around that person, calls out the behavior. Our standards are just as high. You fell short of our standards of inclusion, but we're not going to punish you indiscriminately, and we're going to give you actual skills to get better. Right? We're not just going to ostracize you. We're going to say, here's what you did, and here's how you can do better next time. And the whole book is these seven principles that are an attempt to not in any kind of high concept way. When we were pitching this book, I kept saying, like, whatever you think of my prior work, this is not that. This is like a multi-tool. This is a jackknife. This is a screwdriver. Right? This is not a high concept book. It's really meant to be a practical book that allows you to do better in these conversations so that we can actually stop sort of cowering in fear whenever one of these issues come up and actually lean in and listen and change and grow, right? And then enhance uh, the ecosystem so that it's a more inclusive environment for everyone. Thank you, Kenji. Thank you. Let's give Kenji a round of applause initially. And we're gonna open it up to questions. So some of you must uh, have some burning questions. There's a microphone. I mean, I can ask questions all night. Um, uh, anybody? Oh, yeah, right here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great and inspiring speech this uh, lecture this uh, evening. So my name is Jasmine, and I was born and raised in Liberia and Monrovia. But my parents are of Indian Pakistani origin who now live in the Middle East. And because like, um, I grew up in Liberia, coming to America was a dream and going to NYU. <laughs> so as someone who's African, Asian, both of Indian, Pakistani descent, Arab by marriage, and American by lifestyle, I am uh, wondering like, how can we get this message to third world countries and to countries like, so if you're having this discussion here, I'm thinking, oh my God, like my country, like we are still like a hundred years behind, whether in the Middle East or in India. So how can we get this message, like this idea of, you know, like embracing like people and including people in conversations in the workplace in countries where like there is like no hope? Yes. So, you know, this is where um, there is a kind of, um, maturity curve, I think, uh, and you know, which tools in my toolkit I turn to really depends on where I think we are, right? So oftentimes people sort of are puzzled by the fact that I went from being an academic studying anti-discrimination law and civil rights law to moving into diversity and inclusion. And I explain it by saying the commitment has always been the same. The commitment has been one about civil rights and justice for all, right? It's just that the modalities, the tools that I'm using are different according to context. Because one of the things that I realized about the law is that the law is a very, very blunt instrument, right? And so it's a very effective instrument uh, when the problem is like kind of overt and kind of a naked kind of problem, right? So there's no way to get same-sex marriage, for example, in this country or any other country than through the law, right? So there I think the law is really useful. Where I think the law is less useful, and my life in the law has been an education in the limitations of the law, is when we move beyond kind of formal legal equality and we're trying to build above that floor. So this is like if you're being subjected to covering demands or if you're being subjected to microaggressions on the basis of you know, race or gender or what have you, right? then those things, even if they could be legally actionable, very few of us are gonna spend sort of five years of our life you know, in a lawsuit suing somebody on those bases. And so that becomes a work not of law, but of culture. Right? And so that's why we started our center on diversity and inclusion. So when you say, you know, there are countries, right? So I don't know what issues you're thinking about, but where, where there's a radical overt inequality of subordination, right? Whether that's caste in India or the sodomy statutes criminalizing same-sex sexual intimacy that still exists in 60 plus countries around the world. I'm all for, let's not just have conversations, let's have the law, right? Let's litigate these issues, let's enact policy, right? So I'm willing to drop the hammer in those circumstances. So in some ways, the fact that we are having these diversity and inclusion conversations, I think we should never forget here in the United States, is a kind of luxury right, that we have, right, where certain baseline legal uh, entitlements have already been established, and we're building above the floor that the law has already created. But in societies where that floor doesn't exist, I think law has an enormous role to play, and that's why I remain. I still teach constitutional law every single year right, at NYU. Right? I'm so proud to be a lawyer, right? so I'll never give that up. 
right? And so I want you to think about this as two tracks or different tools for different kinds of problems, different kinds of contexts. Question in the back. Hi, I'm Casey. Wonderful lecture. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I didn't fully understand the controversy scale, but while I was listening to you talk about it, all I could think about was the opposite, like the extreme opposite type of person using the same mentality, ag not against me, but uh, for the lack of better terms, uh, I'm not the professor here, uh, against me, uh, and, and saying the same type of ideals as to why I shouldn't be speaking about my identity and helping them uh, realize where they are on the scale. Can, can you help me figure out how to diffuse that situation if they're using the same tactic, for lack of a better term? Yeah, so, um, I, 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 Here. Thank you. I can take a shot at it, and uh, you can tell me how I do. Uh, so, you know, I cut this off for uh, concision, uh, but I think it might be useful to return to uh, the example of debating same-sex marriage and saying, I wish that my party opposite had acknowledged that this was an equal humanity issue for me. And this is going to be a controversial take, and if there's pushback, I'd, I'd love to get it, right, um, during uh, the reception or uh, after this talk from, from all of you, right? But I actually try to live by that now that I am on the other side of the debate. So now same-sex marriage is the law of the land since uh, our Burgerfeld decision in 2015. And now the people that I'm debating are people who are people of faith who want religious exemptions from laws of general applicability that are civil rights laws, right? So Colorado has a law that says you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. And currently the Supreme Court is considering a case as to whether or not a web designer who doesn't want to honor same-sex marriages on their websites uh, can actually get a religious exemption or a free speech exemption right, from that requirement. So I will die on the hill of saying the answer to that question is no. Right? You do not get to cite your religion as a ground to evade civil rights laws that apply to everybody else. Right? So we saw this back in the Piggy Park cases, which was a barbecue that said, I don't want to serve on religious grounds African Americans, even though the Civil Rights Act of 1964 requires me to do that. And the Supreme Court there said no, right? And I think it should say no to that exemption again, right? So that's, I hope, really clear as my bedrock commitment, and those are the debates that I will have. However, and this gets to your point, when I'm in those green rooms now, I do make an effort to say, we're gonna go out there and I'm gonna argue this really kind of passionately on the basis of law and policy, right? But I acknowledge that for you, right, if I know that they're a person of faith, Right? This actually goes to whether or not you're, you can practice your faith publicly in a way that is meaningful to you and that this may land on you as an attack on your equal humanity. So we're at different points on this controversy spectrum. I do not need to go to where they are. I do not need to change a single argument. I just need to recognize right, in this kind of intersubjective moment right, that this argument may land differently on them uh, than it lands on me. Right? So what I wish had been done for me when I was a minority, right, in these circumstances, uh, I try to extend to individuals who are the minority with, in this very kind of narrow sense of there's a law of general applicability and they're the minority trying to get an exemption from. Does that help? Well, there'll be more time to talk to Kenji. I'm gonna take the, uh, cause I get the mic um, and we're running out of time. So I'm gonna ask the last question here, which is um, what's next for you, Kenji? Yeah, well, Sad to say, right, and actually this first question was wonderful, right, and, and setting up the law versus DNI, and I'm gonna come crying your shoulder about this, Lisa, because this is a real pain point for me. Uh, so I said, you know, law establishes the floor, and then DNI builds above the floor. That's always been the way that I've thought about it, and I've thought about, you know, isn't this great that we live in a society where the laws are stable enough that we can afford to build above the floor? Now that floor is falling away, right? And in fact, the law, far from being the source of diversity and inclusion as it was, the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I mentioned earlier, was really the fountainhead of what we understand to be diversity and inclusion today, as sociologists like Frank Dobbin have very eloquently kind of rendered in historical terms. But now what we see, for example, in the affirmative action cases that are before the court, 
is that we have a very, very conservative, like YOLO court, a maximalist court that's gonna go for everything that they can get, right, as soon as they can get it. And I'm expecting a disastrous set of opinions on the um, affirmative action front. And that will have direct effects on how we do diversity and inclusion in higher ed, right? And then that's only gonna be the first domino to fall, and then there are gonna be restrictions you know, that come from the court, I believe, about so-called reverse discrimination claims under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which regulates employment. And we've already seen you know, from Florida the Stop Woke Act or all these forms of legislation or executive orders that say diversity and inclusion initiatives of various stripes are gonna be shut down. Like you can't say Latin X, right, in you know, Arkansas anymore, uh, in government documents or so on and so forth. So this is actually, you know, I guess I should be happy about this because it makes DNI so relevant to the law and the law so relevant to DNI. So DNI is drifting back into my wheelhouse, right? But you know, I'm not happy about it. Obviously, it's a tragedy. But I do hope that because those two tools that I was talking about earlier with regard to the wonderful first question are converging, that's going to be the next project of saying like when the law is now being used not to support and lift up diversity inclusion, but to actively impede and shut down diversity inclusion, what are the legal arguments that we need to make in order to keep DNI alive? And then what are the adjustments that we need to make to current diversity inclusion initiatives to weatherproof them against what the law can or might do to us? We'll be together for a long time, Kenji. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kenji. Thank you to UDAR, uh, especially Amanda and the alumni relations team. Thank you to the Be Together Conference Alumni Planning Committee. Uh, this Be Together initiative, you all have really taken it and run with it, so thank you. Uh, thank you again to Chris Woods, and of course, everyone who's made this possible. Let me just say it again. Sorry, gotta, gotta do it. Get the book. <laughs> get the book, get the book. Finally, don't forget to, uh, for those of you who are around, uh, we will be having our Martin Luther King Celebration Week. We have a lot of university-wide events. Uh, the highlight of the week will be honoring our faculty on February the 14th. Uh, some of our faculty are selected by our students. It's a really wonderful opportunity. And then we will also have on Thursday, February 16th, a panel uh, with Michael R. Jackson from Tisch, uh, clinical professor, uh, Gallatin, uh, Dr. Shatima Jones, and Maggie Anderson, uh, formerly of the Obama administration. Uh, and the event will also uh, be honoring Michael Dinwiddie as one of our professors. So if you can come, RSVP, and uh, it's, it's on um, our website, the OGI website. So we look forward to seeing you there. Please continue to take good care of yourselves and each other. Have a good night. All right, let's keep those round of applause going. You know, yeah, yeah, they deserve it. They deserve it. Uh, you know, when I was sitting there, I was thinking that I thought that I was pretty fluent in, in DNI, but I realized that I wasn't even scratching the surface, right? I need to read your book, take your class, follow you on Instagram, follow you on Instagram. Like, I just need to absorb what was happening here. Uh, and, and I think that my life and I think that the lives of those around me will be that much better for it. Uh, there are places where these types of conversations only happen during Black History Month or after a traumatic event in the news that galvanizes people in companies, schools, et cetera, but not at NYU. You should leave here knowing that this is a place where you don't have to cover, where you don't have to mute yourself, that you don't have to edit yourself to fit in or make other people feel comfortable, but that we not only solicit, we almost demand your authentic self because that's the only way that our community grows and that we're able to offer something that adds value to our students, to our alumni, and to our community. So thank you first for being here, because uh, I think you, di you didn't have to be here tonight, but I think your presence demonstrates that you're committed to this DNI, not initiative, but a DNI lifestyle, uh, and that you'll take this back as an ambassador. And just in case you did not read the fine print and the registration, you have signed up to be DNI ambassadors <laughs> forever. So you're taking this back to your homes, you're taking it back to your jobs, you're taking it back to your communities. And I hope you also read the book and, and, and really live what we talked about today. I'll tell you, I have notes here that I can just scroll and scroll through, happy to share them afterwards. But again, 
Thank you for coming tonight. We hope to see you the rest of this weekend. We hope to see you the rest of the, the events that we have planned for Martin Luther King's celebration. This is our 18th recognition of Martin Luther King and the impact that he has had on, on the world. Yes, let's give that a round of applause. And you should know that you can have just as strong an impact, right? It starts with someone, and that someone can be you. Right? So I'm looking forward to, to hearing some thoughts and letting the conversation continue tonight. But again, so, so thankful that you were able to participate tonight and that we were able to hear from, from, from each of you. And I know we're that much better for it. So uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's just head on over, right? Let's let, the, let's let the party keep going, all right? <laughs>